We're going to do a little live stream. We're going to be some freestyling here in the uh, Mountain Home Cemetery here in Mountain Home, Arkansas. Um, I do this, I do tours a lot in cemeteries and this is one of my favorite cemeteries to tour because there's a lot of historical people here that I can blend in with the Ozarks. And so we are going to take a walk and uh, we're just going to kind of walk around and see what we can do. I'm going to be popping the camera back and forth, sharing some stories. I don't know how many people that we're going to cover today. We're just going to start walking and then enjoying what's going on. The Mountain Home Cemetery is set, sitting right by the Guy Berry School, and that's it right behind us. That school, there has been a school here since 1854-ish, somewhere through there. Um, it was deeded by the Dodd family. Uh, the guy who originally owned it was Warren L. Dodd. And then there was a guy, his younger brother, his name was um, Owen Dodd. He, was, he actually lived here. Warren Dodd lived down in Izzard County, Arkansas. But they deemed this for a school. And the school was always here since 1854. Um, so it's still a school. This school was um, actually in 1854 it was built. 1864 um, it was burned down to the ground during the Civil War uh, by bushwhackers in the area in the southern part from Baxter County. I'm not going to mention the family names right now, but it was destroyed and burnt. Um, we actually had some raids that came through here during the Civil War on the other side of the hill, came down to the Casey House. Um, just a lot of good history. The place was rebuilt here um, back in 1867. They started in earnest rebuilding it uh, and classes began. In, uh, by 1871, they had their first huge graduation class, and from there, uh, students were being educated all over. There were a couple professors here that were very popular um, for the school. We have two of them. We have Professor Howard and Professor Truman. I want to just show you right here. This is, this is Truman and his wife, Professor Truman and his wife. Um, they were very large into the education system here. Mountain Home was established and was well known as an education center. Uh, Truman and Professor Howard, Professor Truman especially, was fundamental in establishing not only a school here in assistance, uh, he also went up into Douglas County, Missouri. There's a little place called Arno and there was an academy up there and he would travel back and forth from Mountain Home to Arno, Missouri, and Douglas County. Today, the county seat is Ava. So, oh, you, you, gotta, you gotta see this right here. This young man is Andrew. This is Andrew Truman. Uh, this is a sad story. He is actually buried here. He is 13 years old. He was appointed as a Senate page for the state legislature down in Little Rock, Arkansas. He passed away January 12th, 1883. As he was working down, this was a really big honor. Professor Truman and his wife were just tickled that he was chosen and his application was picked, went down to Little Rock, Arkansas. He was on the Senate floor, had a headache and um, he collapsed and he died. My goodness, 13 year old boy die away from home up here in Mountain Home, Arkansas. Well, they took his body, they embalmed the body, they put it in a coffin. Little Rock is known as the City of Roses. And so the ladies and gentlemen, but the ladies especially filled his coffin full of roses. Um, then they put it in, then they took the coffin, they shipped it up to Batesville, Arkansas on a steamboat. Um, then from the steamboat on up, they put it on a wagon and brought the coffin up here. They laid the coffin right up here on the gravesite. They opened the coffin for the young man to say their goodbyes here. And the, the bouquet of smell of roses came out um, because Little Rock is the city of roses. You never really hear about that moniker for Little Rock anymore. It's just, you know, um, but it's a beautiful name. 
City of Roses, but that's what Little Rock was known for. On the political aspect, if we're talking political, uh, this is, this is kind of interesting. This is the Bodenhammer plot. Uh, there is a guy that's buried here, Captain Benjamin Bodenhammer. Um, he was a Union captain during the Civil War. So how does that work when you come back down here? You have family and relation back and forth. He was stationed up in Springfield, Missouri. Um, but Captain Ben's here. The interesting thing about that, he ended up being the president of the Republican Party in 1901. He was a very proud Union Republican. And so you're down here in Democratic Arkansas. Um, but the thing is, there, there's a phrase that says, it's nothing personal, it's just politics. And so that's what's actually going on. In 1908, um, for the election coming up, Captain Bodenhammer actually made the, uh, he made a bet in the newspaper, in the Baxter Bulletin, against anybody who would bet against him in the Democratic Party that the Republicans would win. Uh, and what was he going to put up? He was going to put up a jug of moonshine and a jug of wine. That was the bet. Um, interesting thing is, he was very good friends, and he's now buried down here, and his wife is uh, Eatman, and he was the county clerk. Uh, they would spar politically on different aspects, but it was never mean-spirited. It was never, it was never rude. It was never hateful. Um, it was just politics. But when the politics talks was over with, they would sit down, uh, they would smoke a cigar. The one thing that did actually rile up at one time was Bodenhammer and the close to 90 other Republicans were arrested and put on trial <laughs> for public vulgar and profanity. Um, they were all Republicans. Um, so they went to court here. They, they opposed everything that was going on. They appealed it all the way down to the Supreme Court in Little Rock, and they actually won. Um, they were actually targeting up here the Republicans for swearing. And are you telling me that Democrats did not swear? I don't know about that. I don't know about that. But that's with that's with Mr. Bodenhammer, Captain Bodenhammer. Here is the guy that founded the academy and invited Professor Truman. This is, this is Professor Howard, J.S. Howard and his wife. Um, they came here, 1854, built the male and female academy twice. And so it was a rough, that was a rough going there, right there. Um, I'm looking across the cemetery and there's different things to see and a spy out on different types of monuments. And uh, if you look over my shoulder, there's this kind of obelisk in behind me, but not a true obelisk because on top of it is a pitcher um, and a uh, towel and a cloth. So this is a really good sign. You can look across the cemetery and you can pick different people out. So we have a minister of the gospel. He is a servant. Because if you remember the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet, the, disciples feet, uh, the night before his passion. So we have that symbol of that urn or that picture up there with the towel. And so this is so beautifully ornate. Can you, I'm going to see if I can get all that in there. There we go. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, I just love that. Um, swing on around here. We have a few more people we need to talk about right here. This is one of the guys that they would actually call the founding fathers of Mountain Home, Owen L. Dodd. And so that's his tombstone right there, this small obelisk. And so in memory of Owen L. Dodd, He's born December 11th, 1813. He died in uh, Mountain Home, Arkansas, 1898. So they call him Colonel Dodd. So let's, he was not a military colonel. He was actually a captain in North Carolina of a militia when he was a young man. 
Um, that was about the only military service that he had. Uh, his father was a wealthy plantation owner and planter. Uh, that money traveled with he and his brother. Um, he was the caretaker here in Mountain Home of a large plantation, oh, around 50 slaves. During the Civil War, there were six slaves that were stolen uh, from the North. They were all mulatto, half black, half white. Um, hmm. We know their names. We know their ages because actually he filled out a form after, <laughs> after the Civil War wanting to be reimbursed for what was taken from him during a raid here, October 18th, 1862. He lists the five, the, the five girls and the one young man, um, ages 14, 14, 16, uh, 20, and then and one was 21. He, he lists their names. So we know five of those that were, six of those who were held in slavery here. The interesting thing about Marion County, this was Marion County at the time. Interesting thing about Marion County the vast majority that were in servitude and slavery here um, were not totally, well, shoot. They were not totally black. They were mixed race, and in the census it says mulatto. At the beginning of 1860, somewhere between 1860 and June of 1860, there was a huge exodus of those who were in slavery that were mulatto. I have tracked down quite a few of those who were here in Marion County, a lot over in Yellville, mainly in the Yellville area. They went to Springfield, Missouri. Uh, up in Missouri there, they had a area that they lived on near, Cam on Campbell Street actually, near Campbell, uh, right north of Bass Pro Shops, about a mile. Uh, that whole area up there, that's where they lived. Uh, we have the Tuts, we have the Hogans. Um, what are some of the others? It's just not, Tuts and Hogans were really big. I, actually, after the Civil War, they were actually coming down, visiting their family and checking on their aged mothers and fathers, um, the, even the white mothers for the household, uh, who were not their mother, but they were actually checking on their welfare, which, at first, when I started reading some of the excerpts and some of the stories of that, it just kind of blows my mind. I mean, you're held in slavery. Um, your father is white. Your mother is a slave. And then you're going to Springfield, Missouri. When it's all over, said and done with, you're going to come back down and check on your aged father and, your, and his wife, which is really not your mother, but she was over the, over the farm. So that's a, that's a pretty interesting twist. It's not talked about that often. Uh, but there was a large population here that were of mixed race. Um, some of the children you'll find in the census and then they're gone. Um, there, there was actually, how would we say this nicely without losing it off YouTube, which I've done before. There was a market up north for mixed race children. Uh, all the way from St. Louis on up, up, to, up, up east. And so the crops here were not huge to make a lot of money for produce. Uh, you could, we grew wheat here, we grew corn here. That was for local production and for local use. I mean, to make your cornbread and, and your flour. Wheat was really big here, cotton was big here too, but it wasn't, it wasn't a huge export the cotton was for use, a lot of family use. Later on the years after reconstruction, all the way up in the 1900 to 1930s, people were growing cotton here, um, but it was a tough road to go because these are rugged hills with a lot of rocks. <laughs> so that's your problem there. Um, right here on his side is, is his wife, Mercy. Uh, Mercy Hannum Dodd, she was quite younger uh, than uh, he is. He was born, let's see, 1813. She was born 1833. We have a 20-year age gap between the two. 
I could just keep gabbing on about them, but we need to move on. There's some others that we need to talk about. Oh my goodness. We're gonna talk about Dr. No. Dr. No owned land right on the other side of Guy Berry School. That was his house lot between Guy Berry School and the um, courthouse up there. Dr. No was a well-known doctor. Um, there are stories that he and another guy were making moonshine. There was a squabble between the two of them, actually. It's, his name was Austin Baker. Austin Baker owned a store with the, worked in the store and owned a store with the Baker brothers, where it's today is Rap Barons. But uh, Dr. No, in 1907, right after Christmas, got in a fight and an argument with Austin Baker. Austin Baker was a little drunk. I think he was quite drunk, actually. A little inebriated. Um, he went out and got a gun, came back out in the street, and Dr. No came out in the street. Um, he shot Dr. No and killed him. Oh my goodness, you're a, with a prominent family here in a small community, and you shoot and kill somebody out in the streets. <laughs> How are you gonna argue that one away? How are you gonna defend that? Well, they did. Uh, went to trial, went to court, uh, had some attorneys, really good attorneys, Jerry South did some representation. Um, got it appealed down at Little Rock, gonna have a retrial. And the retrial was getting around to it. But during that time, one morning, 1908, uh, about April, Austin Baker opened up his building, his store with another employee. And wouldn't you know, something went kablooey. Now, doesn't go in detail in the stories what exploded, but it exploded and he was, he was burnt. Uh, the other guy was burnt, injured. The other guy made it. Austin Baker suffered for a little while. Uh, he ended up dying. He died. Um, sad story, he had kids. He was prominent in the Methodist church. Kind of oxymoron stuff going on here, you may think in your head. But he's buried right down here on the other side of the hill from Dr. No. So you have both the perpetrator of the, of the murder and you have the victim, and these both buried here on both sides. Uh, I gotta show you a little thing right here. This is one of my projects, which it's gonna have to be another project this winter time. Oh, here she is. We're gonna have to get some more D2 and spray her tombstone here. Here she is, it's Molly Ophelia Napier. Isn't this beautiful? Look at this little child here little angel there by a bedside. We have the weeping willow tree right here. Here's her name, Molly Ophelia. Um, she passed away. She died in 1884. She was, what was that? She's one year, 10 months old. That's a sad case right here. This is an expensive monument for 1884. It's quite a few different pieces. So you have the monument stone here, you have the footstone, not the footstone, you had the headstone, you got the placeholder here. If you come around over here, this is, this is marble. You have this cradle-like bed. Then you have the footstone down there, both sides. It's mortar and, uh, uh, I'm a little going blank out here in the heat, but uh, mortar and pestle, not mortar and pestle, it's dovetailed in there. Um, I'm gonna think of the phrase after a while once I turn this video off. And inside there, there is a little placeholder for this. <sighs> Folks, this is what happens when you have a really good heart, but you're a little ignorant of things that goes on here. This right here is a lamb. Doesn't look like a lamb, but people with good hearts they, they want to clean things up. Bleach will clean your tombstones beautifully, but it will eat away marble, limestone, sandstone. You do not use bleach. You do not use Bon Ami. You do not use Ajax, ammonia. You don't use those. They break apart um, 
things like this. So this at one time, I remember back, shoot, in the 80s, uh, this was a lamb. This year, 2023, the 80s, the 80s. I remember actually picking this up in 1986 and it was a lamb. Uh, now, here she is. And here, right here, is her father's second wife. And right here she is. Here's the problem. <laughs> Where's Mr. Napier and his wife? Cannot find them. But, look here, I'm, here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. There she is, and there's the second wife. There is this gap right here. So last year in the winter time, I took my digging tool, my little trowel, and I dug through here and I found a concrete border for a family plot here. Then there's two indentations and then I took, hold on folks, here's the woo woo stuff. I took my dowsing rods and I get a hit here and I get a hit here. I'm postulating now. There's two burials here. I'm postulating that his, that her mama died, which did, she died a couple years later. She's buried by her little girl. Then you have the father, Mr. Napier. He's buried here. Then here is his second wife. There are no tombstones for Mr. and Mrs. Napier right here. No tombstones. Uh, 2000, when was that? Oh my goodness, over 10 years ago, we had someone come here, show us how to do tombstone restoration. We actually dug this whole plot out, uh, fixed everything up, straightened it up, filled this up with pea gravel. Unfortunately, grass has taken over the pea gravel. Uh, we're gonna have to dig that out again and pack more pea gravel in there. Um, that's just how it works. Now, this was laying down, this little mama's tombstone here, it's busted. We've had it fixed and jointed. If you have tombstones that are snapped off because you have weed eaters chewing away at limestone here, that's not limestone, that's sandstone. Chewing away at the sandstone and marble, um, they're gonna start snapping in too, especially when you start hitting them with, with uh, lawnmowers. So what we do, we lay it down a bed of pea gravel and then you lay the tombstone on top We've done that with a few of them around here. What happens when it lays down like that? Oh, we have one over here. Let's just go look at this. Here we go. This is the tombstone that got snapped off. Underneath there's a bed of pea gravel. Why do we put pea gravel underneath there? Because when it rains, the water is going to roll off. Uh, if it's straight on the ground and on the soil, it will wick up into the tombstone. So we don't want it wicking up the water in the tombstone because in the, in the wintertime, it's gonna wick that up. It's gonna freeze, bust, and crack the tombstone. So if you have that insulating pea gravel underneath, uh, it's gonna keep it from wicking up the water and soaking there. Um, then you just gotta have to talk to your people who mow the cemetery. Don't run over these things. Mow around them, mow around them. Uh, also with the pea gravel, it's gonna last for about two to three years and then you're gonna to have to pack some more pea gravel in there because the soil, uh, it's gonna start sinking in the soil and it's gonna start wicking up more water. So you kind of have to watch out for that. Oh, let's, let's go down here a little bit. Ah, we're missing them one. Ah, here it is. Let's, let's not go down, let's go to the side. <laughs> there are, now my big thing is to do uh, neck discoids. There are no dis neck discoids here. Not a one. But we do have some historical ones. Now this is a new tombstone that has been placed here years ago for Colonel Randolph DePriest Casey. And there he is. This is a, uh, this is a Confederate cross. He was in the Confederate Army. He was born 1810 and died 1896. So that's a pretty long span to live during that time. You gotta be a pretty tough old knot to go through all the sicknesses and diseases uh, that you 
deal with and everything else. So Colonel Casey was very influential. Down below the hill is the Casey House by the fairgrounds. Um, a lot of stories there. We're not going to be able to share them right now. I do want to mention this. This is the Russell family. So we have Robert and Lily Russell. But these are the older ones, younger ones, but then we get into the Russell kids. Now this is the mother and father here of Russell. Yes, 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 here it is. And as you go through here, there is a, there's a row of children that are buried here. Uh, I'm just gonna flip this over right here. So we have 1857, there's the death, 1857, 1860, Here's another one, 1869 and 1860, cannot read that one right now. And then there's another one right here. So from, here's, here's what's going on. Between 1857 and 1869, this mama, she lost five babies, five babies. Did they have any more? Yes, they did, which they're on down, on down the way here of, of the other Russells. But losing five babies, I mean, that's, think about that. I mean, the health care wasn't the best. <sighs> and so for obstetrics. Okay, speaking of which, health care, we are going to talk about someone right here. Let me pop this around here. I want you to take a good look at this tombstone. Ah. That's it. This is Dr. Simpson. Look at this. Big obelisk. We have a hand pointing to a crown of righteousness right here. Go down here, safe in the arms of Jesus. Dr. Simpson on the side. Now we have both he and his wife are buried here. Dr. J.B. Simpson. And he passed away, look at there, 1902. Oh my goodness, it's a little, okay. So here we go, we're gonna fix something here. I have chopsticks that I get from the Chinese place. And chopsticks will actually help clean things off here. Even if, what's even better, if you, Take a spray bottle of just plain water and let that soak for a minute and take your chopsticks in there. Oh, it cleans everything right up. So here we go, 1902. What happened in 1902? Now that's the wife. That is wrong because he died in 1890. Well, that's his wife died in 1902. <laughs> there, this is better. This is better. Let's flip him around. I'm not perfect, folks. So here we go. He died December 30th, 1898, 47 years old. Dr. J.B. Simpson, his wife, his bur she's buried over here on the other side. He's buried here. What happened December 30th, 1898? 1898 was not a good year agriculturally for Baxter County and actually for the region. A little bit of a drought going on. <laughs> That winter time, this is right after Christmas, people are falling down sick with pneumonia. And so we have five guys showing up at Dr. Simpson's office there off the southwest corner of the square down here in Mountain Home, Arkansas. And uh, he's gonna give them some remedy. So 1898, you got five guys with the pneumonia, they need something to take for medicine. What are you gonna give them? I'm gonna give him whiskey or moonshine. And that's exactly what he did. Um, you mix a little bit of that moonshine with some, with some honey, makes it a little easier to go down. And that's what they did, they all drank it. Dr. Simpson was feeling a little bit under the weather. He drank it too. What happened is tragic. Um, but we were made the laughing stock of the region for a, for a while until something else bad happened. To let be laughed at. Six guys walk out of the doctor's office, out on the square, six guys drop dead. They're dead. 
they instantly die, including, that includes Dr. Simpson himself. The bottle of medicine, whiskey, moonshine was sent to St. Louis, Missouri. Up in St. Louis, a test analysis was ran, and what happened? It was ethanol. It was ethanol. How in the world do you get moonshine replaced with ethanol? I'm gonna postulate. It wasn't a good year for corn. Somebody's gonna sell some whiskey somewhere, and I'm just wanting, wanting to know if some old codger, hillbilly out here thought, my doggy, I don't have enough corn, but I got some corn stalks. I'm just, just postulating. I'm just gonna make the wet rest of my whiskey mash here uh, with corn stalks mix, mixed with corn. The corn will probably help out and distill me some whiskey and sell it. That's what I'm guessing. Cannot prove it. Don't have the bottle of whiskey here anymore to prove it. Cannot find the trace of who sold him the whiskey, but he did use local whiskey and they had it analyzed in St. Louis, Missouri and found out uh, it had a high content of basically of his ethanol. And so don't drink ethanol uh, or anything like that. Um, I'm gonna walk over here a little bit more. There's some wonderful stories, cannot share them all. But what happens, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share some of these stories individually but I'm just doing this whole walkthrough. I've never done a walkthrough. I just want to do this for everyone here. As I'm getting over to my next grave site, I want to say thanks to all that subscribe. My largest, United States, they watch Ozarks history, but my largest group of viewers, thank you, thank you, India. Number one is India. Next is Indonesia, Thailand, Russia, Vietnam, Portugal, Brazil. Uh, we take all of our videos. It may take me a week or so to get it around, but we take our videos and we get them all transcribed into about 150 different languages. India, you have 26 major languages. My goodness, it just kind of blows my mind. But anyway, there's, we're on the back lot here of the historic part of the cemetery. And I've talked about different people through here, and I've talked about Dr. Jason Fritz Norman. Uh, he ended up going from here, from the Male and Female Academy, he ended up going up north across the state line into Ozark County, Missouri. Um, he went to Romance. Up at Romance, he um, pastored a church up there. He's also worked at a... Um, he was a postmaster and a church. Eventually, he left and went to Seymour, Missouri. He was the editor, owner of the Spot, um, Seymour Spotlight, or head, no, Seymour Headlight newspaper, went to Springfield, Missouri. But there is a connection here, kinda. So, his dad, Abner, was killed during the Civil War in 1862. Abner, was dug up later in, 18, in 1972 and brought here to Baxter County to the Mountain Home Cemetery. Here's the interesting thing. Dr. Jason Fritz, the son of Mr. Abner, knew Victor Lo Kilo Loba. Who is he? Well, in 1919, he was very influential because he comes from up in northern part of Ozark County also. His dad's a pastor up there. He ended up being the, one of the, tested one of the highest exams in the state of Missouri for a teacher. From there, um, he went on up to St. Louis, Missouri and started working in the railroad. And he just kept advancing. He ended up forming his own railroad company and he was gonna build a railroad from Springfield, Missouri, all the way down to Little Rock, Arkansas. How was that gonna work? He was gonna start at Mansfield. Go from Springfield at Mansfield, turn south, go from Mansfield to Ava to Gainesville, down to Three Brothers Midway, Mountain Home, Arkansas, straight on down across the White River, straight on down to Little Rock, Arkansas. One thing I left out here and talking about in 1919 is that Cotter, Arkansas was already bustling with train, with a train depot and traffic and everything else. He was just gonna straight bypass that and he was gonna put a railroad 
Depot here in Mountain Home, Arkansas. The Baxter Bulletin and the people in Mountain Home were absolutely head over heels in love with, with Mr. Loba. Absolutely in love with him. He was a man of progress. He, the people in Gainesville, Missouri, they knew who he was. They were, he was going to give them progress. You have a railroad. Ozark County, here we go. Ozark County is the only county, I believe, in the state of Missouri that doesn't have a railroad in it. He was going to split Ozark County right down the middle with the railroad through Gainesville, going down, uh, work its own way on down through here, down through the Lick Creek Valley, and down on to Mountain Home, Arkansas. You talk about progress. This man was thinking progress. He lived out near, uh, near Gasville, Arkansas. Uh, down around Thanksgiving time, he was sitting at his table, and um, I believe he was shot and killed by someone that could be associated uh, down at, over at Cotter with the railroad. Uh, the guy was tried, convicted, went to prison. People from Cotter appealed to the governor, and guess what? The guy was set free. There's, there's a more of that story I can actually get into, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to hit something right here. Something that's pretty interesting I want you to think about. So we have Baxter County, Arkansas. We have uh, Ozark County, Missouri. They're kind of isolated, pretty isolated over the years. What really opened everything up really was the dams. We have the Norfolk Dam being built in the early 40s, and then in the 50s, we have the Bull Shoals Dam opened everything up here. My opinion, reconstruction really didn't happen when reconstruction was supposed to happen after the Civil War. Reconstruction took place here in Baxter County and the Twin Lakes region here. We call it the Twin Lakes region. Reconstruction actually took place with the dams coming in. But let's back up. What would happen? What would it look like if that railroad actually came through Ava, hooking up with Gainesville, hooking up with Mountain Home, hooking up all the way down to La Rock, Arkansas. We would not have the community we have today. We would not have what we have. Things, things in history could have been totally different. You put in a railroad, what are you gonna be able to do right beside that railroad? You can put in a really nice highway um, we, and we were, we were an enclosed community for years and we were just still, you know, we're opening up. People are finding Mountain Home, Arkansas, believe it or not. People are finding us. Um, but what would it be like if it wasn't for the death of that one person? What would it be like? Uh, things would be totally different, probably. Uh, there wouldn't be a small community here, it would be a larger community. Uh, would we have the crime rate higher? Um, what, what would it look like here? It would be totally different. It just kind of blows my mind that how one person's actions can sadly affect not just a community, but it can affect a whole region. It can affect the, the Ozarks would be different if Victor Kilo Loba wasn't assassinated in 1919. Totally different. Um, it just blows my mind. We make a difference. One person makes a difference. No matter where you are at, no matter how you may feel, one person can make a difference. We can all make a difference. I mentioned the word community, and I'm, I'm really big on cemeteries and talking about this one thing, communities. We are a community in the Ozarks. We're hillbillies. That's our community moniker. But let's just break it down to a town. Let's break it down even smaller to smaller suburbs and smaller villages. Every little town community had a cemetery. A cemetery is a reflection of community. Um, we are a community. This right here, what we are looking at today in the Mountain Home Cemetery is a community. Excuse me for adjusting my camera here. We are a community and um, you can't get around it. Let's just be blunt here, because I'm going to. 
here's what I really think stinks. During COVID, it was one of the worst things that fractured the communities in the Ozarks and across the nation. We, <laughs> you, you, you might be able to guess where I stand on one part or the other, but community is our strength. Um, shelter in place, well, crap. I, I have a hard time with actually advancing and doing things together when you're all, everyone's hunkered down. I'm not gonna go there, but I'm just telling you what, it's a community. Well, since we're talking communities, let's talk a little bit more. Let's talk about embalming, and not, em and, uh, not embalming, cremations. So we cremate people, that's fine. That's, that's, your, that's your prerogative and everything else. Then we cremate people and we scattered them in the woods. Norfolk Lake, I've seen people scattered in Norfolk Lake right where the intake valve's at for the Mountain Home Water uh, District. Bull Shows Lake, put them in the Buffalo River, put them in the wilderness. Here's the problem that I have as a historian. I love documents, I love primary resources. Tombstones are documents. When people are cremated, there's little done in the cemetery anymore. If they're scattered somewhere, that urn is sitting somewhere. Well, mom's scattered, you know, we scattered her in the garden. That's where she loved to be, where she, or wherever. What happens with, with a cemetery? You bring the remains of that person here. It's a great place. Okay, if you want to scatter somebody, take, take a cup or two and scatter them somewhere. I'm telling you what. A cemetery is something where you can go and say, this is where my loved one is. You can come here, you can mourn, you can weep, you can restore, you can come to grips with it, and then you can stand up and you can get in your car and you can drive away and say, okay, I've dealt with this, life has to go on, and it helps you grow out of that grief. I'm, I'm just postulating here, but this is what... But also when you put someone in a cemetery, it reflects a community. Because when I look here, there's families there. There's a family of Dodds. Oh, there's the Casey's. They're related, they got some relation there. Over here are the Wolfs. Oh, related with the Casey's. We have the Trumans, we got the Howards. We have a neighborhood. So we have a neighborhood right here from the Dodds to the Trumans down to the Nose. We have a neighborhood that starts here and goes over down the hill. There's a neighborhood. We have the Russell family. The Russell family and the Simpsons. We have a neighborhood over here, three streets over. It used to be called Globe Street um, in Mountain Home. It's no longer Globe Street, but we have a neighborhood. We have family relationships. We have a neighborhood. We have neighborhoods. This is a community reflecting, a cemetery is a community reflecting your town. And, uh, I'm not saying this because I was on the cemetery board, but a cemetery is something where you can go, you can deal with it. And it also reflects who you are in life. It's a monument. So your monument is actually a stone here, okay? But your monument also are your friends that are reflected here. It's just not your work of a beautiful monument. What is reflected about your life? All these other people surrounding you in death, they were, they were your friends, companions, your enemies, your neighbors, the reflection of it. They're all here. Just saying. So if you cremate, here's my recommendation. If you cremate, get a stone, get a marker somewhere nearby. Pick one out with your mate. Pick one out by your, if you don't have a mate, if you're not married, pick someplace out. If you're going to be cremated, have somebody put your urn in there. If you're not going to bury your ashes there, have something there that reflects you and your community. A monument is a, is a, is a document that will last maybe 150, 160 years. These, these ones over from 1857, 160, 170 years. They'll be gone in 200 years. We probably need to do something else about that. But it's a document. When I look, people call me for obituaries as a historian and, and stories about their family. I rely on the documents in cemeteries. Um, 
that's what I'm relying on to help me go around. And then I'm starting looking around going, wait a minute, they're related here. It's the same thing when I look at a land plat. There's a relationship there. People marry neighbors. People get in feuds with neighbors. It's, it's important. It's important. Um, I was actually going to go and start reading about Dr. J Jason Fritz Norman and read his letters here about his growing up here in Mountain Home. Um, I'm not going to do that right now. I think I'm just going to have to do another video and sit down and just read his letters here. And then I'm going to get into his stories about the history of this region of Baxter County, Ozark County, a little bit of Douglas, Marion County especially, uh, stuff on the Civil War. He's got, he's, got, he's got stories here that I've never heard before, and I, I thought I've heard everything for this area. He even enhances some of the things that Turnbow says. He mentions some of the same things that Turnbow talks about. And so when you start correlating bet between Dr. Norman and S.C. Turnbow, about the events during the Civil War and especially on the White River and the Saltpeter Cave and the attack there, uh, the people who died and got shot and killed there. He even talks about his brother getting killed in Ozark, Missouri in November 17th, 1869. And Dr. Jason is kind of thankful. He, he hates that he, his brother died, but it made his life a little easier because of the reputation that his brother carried. And so apparently his brother got in a shootout in Ozark, Missouri, November 17th, 1869. I am trying to look this that part of the story up. Haven't really delved into that really heavily. I'm gonna start doing some research on that. It's, it's gonna be a fun, fun time connecting all this stuff together. So this has been our live event. I wanna thank everyone for uh, clicking in, sharing, liking on our channel. Thank you again to all those who are over, that are, that are not in America. United States, I think my population in the United States goes somewhere around anywhere between 33 to 42% that watch Ozark's history. So I'm thankful for those uh, in other countries listening to us. And I'm, I believe you're, you're, you're uh, learning some stuff about our culture. And maybe not that we're not always so different, but we have elements that correlate with each other, that are the same. And so really enjoyed spending time with you. I will see you very soon on Ozarks History. Thank you so much. I will have everything translated and transcribed within the week. Have a great day. Bye-bye.